great. So this morning, we're in our series on growing in groups, and uh, next week is when we're going to finish this sermon series. Uh, in fact, next week, I will be tag team preaching, me and Amy Cherboni, uh, Pastor Herman's wife. Uh, we're going to be tag teaming. Our kids, it's our fifth Sunday, so our kids are going to be here, and uh, we're going to finish up our sermon series on growing in groups. So this is my last shot at you talking about groups, so I'm going to unload the wagon. Is that all right? Healthy things grow. Healthy things grow. Are you growing? Do you have a growth plan? Do you have somebody that's helping you grow? Do you have a mentor? Do you have some accountability? Healthy things grow and people are not any different. Some growth can happen independently by ourselves. But God created us for community and the best way to grow is to belong to a group of people that love you as you. And receive your unique contribution to the world with joy. I don't know anybody I've ever met that said, hey, would you like to have a couple people that really think you're awesome, that like being around you, that life you? Would you like to have a group of people like that? Most people would say yes. It's just the hard part of being in some relationships and finding out whether that's the right one or not the right one for me, right? But we're all called to be in a relationship with somebody. So today I'm going to talk about synergetic power. Synergetic power. This is one of my favorite subjects is synergy. And what is synergy? Synergy is the cooperation of two or more entities that creates a result greater than the sum of its parts. So I am, uh, I'm, I'm probably a pretty typical kind of guy. Um, a week ago, I had a small health thing, a small health thing, just baby, baby health thing pop up. You know, as you age a little bit, sometimes these little things pop up. So I had a small health thing pop up. And when it did, and I realized it was a thing, then I started thinking, I felt this way before. This is not the first time I felt that before. But I just ignore that stuff because I'm a guy. And if you're a guy or you're an athlete or I was in the Marine Corps, you're taught to ignore discomfort, ignore pain, and just go get the job done. Any guys in the room know what I'm talking about? We, we, just, we just ignore it until it becomes so bad that we say, hey, this could be a thing, right? So then we go get take care of stuff. But, if, you know, you're a young buck. You're like, man, pain's nothing to me. I'm tough. I'm bad. It's pushed through. And so that's something I don't pay a lot of attention to is discomfort, temperature, stuff like that. One thing I do pay close attention to is energy. I believe energy is very, very important. I've always said that, that time is more important than money. Doesn't matter how much money you have, if you run out of time, it's over. It's just over. Time's more important than, than money. But then I heard somebody say, yeah, but energy is more important than time. Because you can have all the time in the world, but if you don't have energy to get up and do what God's called you to do, what's the use in having time? And I thought, that's important. we got to manage the amount of energy. So I pay close attention to who are people who life me and who are people who might drain me. I pay attention to circumstances that, that life me. Like Pastor Mike, he, he, Pastor Mike could do three hours of counseling and he would leave with more energy than he went in the room. I would be in there for three minutes and have less energy than when we started when we went in the room. What, 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 what lifes you and then what drains you? I, yesterday, I was, I was sitting, uh, I was at the house. I just got back from the gym. I turned on the ball game and I was going to do something. I don't even remember what I was going to do. I was going to do something non-productive, watch the ball game, do something non-productive. And then I remembered that one of the things I have to do this week is Erwin McManus' lesson on leadership, the first lesson. So I said, well, I'll just get out of the way real quick. And, and I pulled up his lesson, and I read his lesson real quick. And before I could get done with that five-minute reading, I was so fired up that I didn't want to watch a ball game. I didn't want to be unproductive. Aaron McManus spoke at the GLS, and this is based off of his speech at the GLS. He wrote a book called The Last Arrow. And he starts the book by saying, I've got some bad news. I'm dying, but so are you. Will you live before you die? That's the question. We're all dying. We're all dying. He didn't know this, but a couple months later, he had serious aggressive cancer that had been in his body. He didn't even know that he really was dying. And so he goes to the doctor, and the doctor, they, do, they operate, and they said, we don't know if you're going to make it. We don't know if this is going to work. And, and he gets up that very day after surgery and says, I, I need to start walking up down the hallway. So they're not like, no, sir, you're, you're, you're going to be in great pain. He said, I'll lean into the pain, but I will walk and I will live until I die. I refuse to not live. 
today is day one. I am alive and I'm going to live. And so his book's about the last arrow. And he says, I want to shoot every arrow I have. He says, when, when I die, I want my quiver empty and the last arrow is going to be in my hand. That, that's how I'm planning on dying. I will live. And he says, two things hold us back, pain and fear from doing what God's called us to. I, I read that in five minutes. I'm like, man, I got to do something. I got to I, I, give me a bow and arrow. I, I'm not even an archer, but give me a bow and arrow. Something's got to be shot right now, right? He energized me. He filled me with energy and passion and zeal. And, and I think that's a message for all of us. John Maxwell said not too long ago, he says, dad's 96 years old. And his dad said, son, this, this could be the biggest year of my life. I've got more important things to do this year than I've ever had before in my life. And he said, my dad will live until he dies, and he knows the difference between the two. I want you to live. I want you to live. I want you to be alive. I want you to be vibrant. So what is synergy? Synergy is, 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 is a cooperation or relationship where two or more people, two or more businesses, two or more entities come together, and in the unity of that coming together, there's a, a, a third piece, another piece that emerges that's bigger than those two pieces. This is amazing. It's, so here's, if, I, if you hear anything I say today, I want you to go home and say, what Pastor Nick preach on? You're going to say, synergy. It's God's law. It's a God law. It works for everybody. It works all the time. It is a proven fact that God created this, and you can participate in it starting today if you want to, okay? It's a God law. I'm going to use two passages to talk about it just a little bit. Matthew 18, 19 through 20. You've heard this passage before. Again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Now, there's two things I want to point out to you in this passage right here. He says, if two of you agree if two of you agree. Now, that word agree means to barter. It means negotiate. It means to, how many of you all have ever traveled overseas and went to an, a market and where you haggled? With, isn't that fun? Some of y'all like it. Some of you, do you like it? You like haggling with it? Uh, it's part of culture. Like when we go to Ghana, West Africa, they expect you to haggle with them. I mean, they would be, they would be upset with you if you didn't play the game. I mean, you, you have to walk up and they're like, hey, this costs 40 CDs. We're like, I don't want to pay 40 CDs. I'll pay you 20 CDs. And they're like, no, oh, no, that's terrible. You can't do that. And you start to walk away and they come back and grab you. And now, I don't care. You tip them if you want to tip them on the back end, but you don't pay full price. You never pay full price. So, so it's part of the thing. Haggle. And that's what this word means. If two of you can haggle, if two of you can negotiate, if two of you can barter together, and, and what's a fair price of something? What's the fair market value of something? It's what a willing seller is willing to give to a willing buyer, right? So what does that mean? That means a win-win. It is, it is when somebody, somebody is willing to pay. I talked to first service this. I said, uh, Tina and I had a business deal about a year ago. And, and it was with another Christian brother, and we were in this conversation. And at, at one point, I stopped and just said to him, you know what? I don't think you're trying to find a win for me at all in this. I, I want to win in this, but I want you to win. But I don't feel like you're looking out for a win for me. And that's not how I do business. I, I'm not interested in doing business where somebody has to lose. As a Christian, that, that diminishes. That doesn't add. I'm here to add value to the world. So if we do a deal, I want a deal where I win and you win. I want a deal where you go home and brag to your wife that you took me to cleaners, but I go home and brag to my wife I took you to cleaners. You know what I'm saying? I, I, it, we both have to win or I don't even want to do the deal, right? And so, so, so this, this agreement means that, that we know each other enough that, that we're going to do something together and both of us are going to come out with a win on the back end. And so he says, if two of you all can negotiate, barter, and haggle together, then I'll bless that. Okay. And the second thing the scripture says is, oh, this is good. He says, if two of you on the earth can come into agreement, then my Father who's in heaven will bless it. I like that a lot. Because he's got better resources in heaven than I do on earth. And, and, and if you look at just your paycheck and just your bills, it'd be easy then to say this is hopeless. There's no hope that I, this paycheck is going to take care of all these bills. And, and, and you, if you're just looking in the earthly realm, you could be hopeless. But if you could look at your paycheck and your bills 
and then recognize that we have a father who does not live around here, who didn't come from around here, who doesn't have a mountain poverty mentality, who sits in abundance and wants to bless you, and you can come into agreement on earth, you tap into heavenly resources. What we're wanting to have happen here through the generosity campaign we did last year, through our, our, our pursuit of God's gaudy goodness, what we're wanting to happen is where Western North Carolina stops looking like Western North Carolina, but it starts looking like Southern heaven. <laughs> we want the Southern part, right? So it starts looking like the mountainy Southern part of heaven. And then people on the outside start getting jealous saying, why is Western North Carolina so blessed? Why does it look like he heaven? Why is drug addiction being dealt with? Why is abuse being dealt with? Why is poverty? Why are orphans and widows being adopted into the family of God? How come there is peace and love and joy and abundance in Western North Carolina? Why does God not love us too? That's what we want to do. We want to shock the world. And they're like, why does God love Western North Carolina so much? He doesn't love us more than other people, but we're on a journey to attract the kingdom, the kingdom culture to Western North Carolina. So that when Jesus comes back, we, this, our land looks like his land. He deserves it. He's not going to come back and save us at the last minute before the devil eats us up and devours us. He's going to come back while we've got our foot on his, on his throat and we have conquered him and we have dominion in this place. And th this land looks like his land. Yeah. Like that. That's all. The Holy Ghost made me do that. Is that what it feels like, Chip, when the Holy Ghost gets your leg? Um, I better get to my sermon. <laughs> For where two or three are gathered together, my name, I am there in the midst of them. Uh, Dr. Harvey taught me this years ago. He said, anytime you get believers together, make sure you bring Jesus into the conversation. Make sure Jesus comes in. He said, you know, even if you're going to sit around and watch the Super Bowl, you know, you're going to sit around and you're going to watch something. If you've got believers in the room, why would you have a party and not bring Jesus to the party? I, if you stop for a second, how many times have you ever had conversations or meetings with other believers, and you forgot to invite Jesus into the party. Right? We've all done it, right? But every chance you can, if you, you can take a normal conversation and make it spiritual if you just invite Jesus in. See, I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help you just a second. Every Sunday morning at 830, we have what we call the huddle. And there's a circle of people that gather down here. And it's, it's to anybody that's going to be on the microphone, it's people in the sound booth, whoever's preaching, doing announcements. We all come together and we just talk through what the service is going to look like today. And then one of us will pray over the service. We'll pray for you, that you will get here safely that you will not be stressed out, that you'll be able to connect with Papa today, that you'll make a new friend, that you'll hear a word that inspires you. We pray for you. But here's what happens. A lot of times believers believe that this, this piece right here, where two or three more gather my main, I'm there in the midst of us. And a lot of times what we think is we get in our circle and Holy Ghost is sitting somewhere over there just sort of like watching us. But that's not what the Holy Ghost does. The Holy Ghost walks up and he taps your hand and says, here, let me, let me in the circle. And he grabs our hands. He gets right there in the middle of us. He's like, I, I, you want me in this service? We're like, yeah, Holy Ghost. He's like, where am I at in the, in the schedule? <laughs> now, that's what he says to me. That's his conversation with me. And, and so he's like, hey, I, I want to I be in this service too. And, and, and when we come together, to gather together in his name, we got to make sure that we don't have church without him. But the good news is he's not far away watching us. He gets right in the circle and he's like, hey, can I, can, can I sing that song? I'd like to lead that song. Can I do that song? What if I get in the middle of your message and I give you a point that you didn't have, which happened first service, but you're getting this second service because he, he got in the huddle this morning, okay? So here's, here, here's, here's my points. Number one, it's a God law. Synergy is a God law. It, it exists in biology. It exists in chemistry, in physics, in business, in sports, Everywhere you look, synergy exists. It is a law. And it, sowing and reaping is a law. If you sow, you're going to reap. If you judge people, you'll get judged back the same way. It's a law. You don't have to be a Christian. If you're a philanthropist that's not a Christian, you will be blessed because you give. It is a law. Synergy is a law. Now, that word synergos there in, in, in the Greek, that word actually was, was first created in 1632. So that's like 500 years ago. That's a long time. 
And if you look in Wikipedia, if you look, it'll actually show you a graph of how often that word has been used over the last 500 years. And that word starts off like a flat line. It's just flat, flat, flat for hundreds of years, barely used in literature, barely used. And then all of a sudden it goes whoosh like this in the last 60 years. Now you think of how much technological advancement we've had in the last 60 years. That word was discovered. People have put those two things together. In fact, we've had more technological advancement in the last 60 years than the rest of creation combined. That, that word synergy is where two entities will work together to create a third piece that's bigger than e either one of them. So that word synergos means two things. It means together, working, or working together. And there's a guy named Jay Hall, and Jay Hall did some research on group dynamics, and he wanted to find out what teams looked like that weren't synergetic and what teams looked like that were synergetic, and he found some really amazing stuff. He, whenever he would, there's two things, there's two things that create an environment for synergy to happen. The first is a common task, that for whatever reason, more than one person, we're going to do something together. There's a common task. We're going to win a ball game. We're going to come to church this morning. Uh, we're going to go serve the school. There's a common task. And the second thing is that there has to be a level of relationship between the team members while they do the task. And this is what he found out. Whenever he would bring a group of people in and he gave them a task to do together, they didn't know each other, so a brand new task, he would encourage them to disagree with each other pretty strongly at the very beginning of the exercise. He'd say, if you don't like it, push back. You don't like it, say something. And in the groups that would do this, they began to know each other's proclivities and preferences. They began to care for one another because they knew something about each other. And what happened is the sum of the effort in that group was bigger than the highest producer in the group. So somehow the group outproduced the highest producer in the group. Okay? Now, on the groups that did not try to make relationship, did not disagree with each other, they just tried to get, the, they focused on the task, they would get the task done equal to the highest producer in the room. When I saw that, I about had a TU session <laughs> because I've been on teams that produced to my level because I was the one driving the train. I have been on teams where they rode me until I couldn't be rode any longer. And I've been on teams where I was a contributing part, but it was way bigger than me. I've seen that happen before in my world and in my life. If, 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 if your focus is on getting the task done, you will be less productive because why? Because God rewards relationship. People that aren't Christians are figuring this stuff out. And they're like, wait a minute. With God, it's always about relationship. He doesn't care as much about the task as he does the relationship. So when you focus more on the relationship, he lets you be more productive at the task? What? Who knew? I didn't know. By the way, I watched myself on that video a few minutes ago. Who knew? I talk with my hands so much. I, 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 didn't, I honestly didn't know. So I just watched that video. And I'm like, wah. <laughs> Next week, I'm supposed to sit in a chair and speak. And I don't even know how that's going to go. I just don't even, we're going to see how that works out. So, so let me just wrap this, this one point up. It is a God law. And the God law is if you will not do life by yourself. Okay, here's the thing that hit me first service. In America, we value independence. But the kingdom does not value independence. I'm not going to say independence, having an independent spirit is a sin. But I am going to say something pretty harsh. Having an independent spirit can be a form of idolatry. We replace God with us. I will do it. I will take care of my own stuff. I will make it on my own. I don't need anybody else. I will do it, and it's a form of idolatry. You were not created to do it by yourself. You were not created to do it on your own. You were not created to be the beginning and end of all your needs. You were created to be a piece and a part of society, a part of the family. We were created for relationship, and God doesn't want any of these, these independent, rogue, lone rangers out there. He wants the family to come together so that he can do something bigger than the individual pieces. So it's a law. If you're independent, you lose out on synergy. You don't get to experience it. But if you will come into relationship around a common task 
and choose to make relationship with the people on the common task, God steps into that and suddenly the piece that's bigger than the sum of the parts is God because he rewards relationship. Wow, that life's me. I'm looking for my tribe. Number two, we are better together. Better together. How many of you all have ever heard of a group called the Inklings? A couple people. Well, of course you do, Diana. Yes. So the Inklings, is, you'll, you'll probably have heard of them. You probably just didn't know they were called that. So there was a group of um, authors that would meet in Oxford, England, about 50, 60 years ago. And uh, you ever heard of J.R. Tolkien? Mm-hmm. And you ever heard of C.S. Lewis? Mm-hmm. With about, about a dozen of them or so would get together every Tuesday at a pub called the Eagle and the Child. And I don't know what that has to do with each other. You know, that's, like, <laughs> that's scary. It's like the Eagle. <laughs> Where's my child? Um, if you want to lose a child, you bring it to the pub. And, you know. So they, they would get together every Tuesday, because Tuesdays are holy, every Tuesday and have a pint, and they would talk about what they were writing. Now, particularly J.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis, they had a passion for fantasy, for mythical writing. They wanted to make up an alternate universe, alternate worlds. You know, you know J.R. Tolkien created Middle Earth and, and the, the, the uh, Lord of the Rings, and, and C.S. Lewis wrote, created Narnia and the Lion, Witch, Witch in the Wardrobe. And they, had this, they loved fantasy and, and mystical stuff. And I, I never liked it. I've, I've never liked it. I don't know. I grew up really religious, and I just, I don't know. Tina loves this stuff. She loves it, and she likes, you know, reading all the stuff, going to the movies. She likes that stuff. And so she's taught me a lot of the stuff I'm sharing with you today. And um, <laughs> I use all my sources. So, so they're talking one day, and they said, you know, many cultures have fantasy writings, but they're usually directed towards kids, like fables. And he said, but many cultures use fantasy and they'll convey their values or their stories through the fantasy and mythical writings. There's one group that don't do that and it's called Christians because we don't create these other worlds. And and so they said, why not? Why can't we create our own world with our own characters and build the redemption story within the story? Let's aim it at adults, at everyone, and then people who don't even believe in Jesus or are averse to hearing about Jesus can be watching a story and slowly it can dawn on them that this is the story of Christ. This is the story of redemption. This is the story of God you know, coming back to the earth. And so, so those, those two guys particularly, they begin, they write two of the greatest things we've ever read. I mean, two great masterpieces of writing, movie, blockbusters. And so they would get together, by the way, they would get together at the Eagle and the Child, and it's called the Rabbit Room. And Madeline Hagen just got back from the Rabbit Room a couple weeks ago. She was just there in Oxford, England. And there's a Shakespeare book in the Rabbit Room that if you're part of this group, you can go and sign your name in the book, and it stays there in the Rabbit Room that you were there, and you're, you're, an, you're an artist too and all that kind of stuff. So soon I preached first service. She came up to me afterwards. I was just there. I was just there. And um, so that was pretty cool. I love that we have international world-changing young men and women in this church, right? So what happened is they got together and they started talking. What are you writing about? What are you writing about? What are you writing about? And in that comes this creativity, this collective. Can we use that word? Collective, where something's bigger than it really is. There's a real-life example, and I'm not getting paid commission to bring this up this morning, but the Village Potters, in Asheville. Sarah Rowland owns the Village Potter in Asheville. And it's one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. It is a bunch of potters, a bunch of artists that sit around doing art stuff all day long. (laughs) That is a business that has eight to 10 streams of income. Very rarely can you find art people 
who are business people and bring them together. Now, I'm intrigued by the business side. So I, I, so I go in there, and you walk in, and there's a gallery. There's pottery that you can buy. There's paintings from other artists. There's, like, all kinds of artists. You can just, it's a gallery. You can go in, and you can buy the stuff. But if you turn the corner, you'll see a room of six or eight potters just throwing clay and making stuff. And, and then you'll see some apprentices off over there and everything. And, and, and so I asked Sarah, I said, you know, walk me through. And she started, I was like, Sarah, you're making money off of that, 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 that. I mean, you thought this thing through. I mean, you are, you're a business, won't you? Absolutely. And so I'm, I go there for the business. And at some point, I realize that I think I can sing. Because <laughs> it's so creative in there that suddenly I think, hallelujah. <laughs> and I think I can dance. I won't show you that one. I think I can. I, there's some... I, I, you walk in there and it begins to dawn on you that you are in a fertile atmosphere. I mean, I'm a writer, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm seriously, I'm going to tell Sarah, hey, can I come over one day and just sit in the corner and write? Because it is so fertile in this place of creativity. And what happens is, is when you add six to eight artists together and they begin to dream and laugh and play and create, Papa steps into that that's what synergy is. It is an energy that comes from God that blesses the collective for doing life together. That's what I want to experience in my life. I want to contribute something, but I want to stand in awe. How did we do that? How did that happen? That was bigger than we could have ever possibly hoped to do. And it was fun. We had life. We had joy. It was wonderful. So we are better together. So we got to find some people we can be better with. Last point is synergy. Uh, synergy incur. I'm sorry. En enables sus uh, sustainability. Synergy enables sustainability. Um, when I go to the when I go to the gym, like last week, somebody came up to me and said, uh, "By the way, your sermon after your sermon, everybody in church is going to join a growth group or go to a gym. One of the two. <laughs> and uh, so going to the gym." We wear these belts, so these monitors, and they project up on the screen, you know, whether you're about to die or not. Right, Tobias? <laughs> Tobias and his friend, they're both EMT, and so they're working out. And I went over to him and said, I'm good. I just look like I'm about to die, but I'm, I'm good. Don't worry and everything. So we have fun. At the, but I watched, the, I, I can, I'm in a class, and we're working out, and I can see whether the person next to me is burning more calories or more MEPs than I am. And I, I, I can see that how many calories I'm burning. And there's something about being in a group. You know, if I go to the gym and work out by myself, it's like, oh, that's good. I'm good for the day, you know. <laughs> but if you go and you go with other people, it's something about enjoying the pain together that makes you stay and do the whole thing. And, and there's camaraderie and, the, you know, it, doing stuff together. No, it does. Let me ask you something. Have you ever been in a painful situation in your life? Was it easier or harder with the people sitting with you? If people joined you in your pain, did it help you? Yes, it does. You know what we call that in the ministry? We call it the ministry of presence. You don't have to fix it. You just got to be there with them. It's called the ministry of presence. You, you don't have to have the answers of why does bad things happen to good people. You just have to show up and sit and be there and talk and, and be uncomfortable with them being uncomfortable. It's, it's called the ministry of presence. But, we, but it's just, life is sustainable when we do it together. So we can learn a couple of things from some things in nature. Uh, a lot of this stuff I get from, from Tina, by the way. I'm going to read this passage. I'm going to give you a couple examples. Now, in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers. I liked that it wasn't all prophets. It wasn't all teachers. We all get to be different be ourselves. Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And they ministered to the Lord. I like this. They ministered to the Lord and fasted. And the Holy Spirit said, let me in that circle. Do you see? They're, they're together. They're together. They're fasting and praying. And when, you're, when you come together and you're serious about what's the task, we're going to pray and fast. We're going to get together. The Holy Spirit steps up to the circle, grabs their hands, and says, now separate from me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I've called them. Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. And so being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia. And from there, they sailed to Cyprus. So what happens is, is, is I like that they were together. See, Jesus sent people out two by two, and the Holy Spirit just sent them out two by two. 
It's biblical. God doesn't want us doing life by ourselves. He wants us to have people in our boat. He wants people to do life with. Jesus sent them out two by two. The Holy Spirit says, separates all and Barnabas for me. The work I have for him sends them out two by two. We're created to be part of a bigger family, and our lives will be better if we'll invite people in. So um, Tina, my wife, loves trees. She loves trees. And so she reads books about trees. She's not like horticulture. She's an artist. She likes painting trees, but she likes to understand the beauty and personality of trees, right? And so um, this, the pecan tree is very interesting. The pecan tree, you know, every year pecan trees produce pecans, right? And they'll do that for a couple years, two years, three years, five years, seven years. They just produce pecans. And then every once in a while, there's a thing called mast fruiting, M-A-S-T, mast fruiting, where suddenly the pecans will go crazy and produce a bumper crowd, a bumper crop of, of pecans. But here's the weird thing. Nobody knows when they're going to do it. The trees decide, and they all do the bumper crop on the same year. Same time. So what happens is, that in our terms, it's like this. The country's like, save, budget, save, budget, save, budget, splurge. <laughs> the, 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 they, they're like, could be a bad winter. Keep your resources. Could be a bad winter. Got to watch our stuff. Store up, store up. Got to store up. Too much, too much, everybody. And, and the, but what happens is all the pecan trees mass the same year, and nobody knows why or how. They just do it together. It's just part of what they do. So um, th there's a, been research done. There's actually a book called The Secret Life of Trees that Tina has read and <laughs> taught me all about. Oh, The Hidden Life of Trees, sorry. The Hidden Life of Trees. That's just a detail. We don't care about details. Uh, <laughs> I have a tattoo that says, it's a story. She has a tattoo that says, details matter. <laughs> we don't, but. So they, they did some research in the African Sahara, and they, they had a, a, a herd of giraffes, and they watched them go up to this grove of acacia trees. And the giraffes started just ravishing on these trees. And the next thing they know, the, the giraffes start backing away from the trees that they're eating, and they're, they're not happy. They're, they're not happy. And they, they end up leaving that grove and won't eat any of the trees in that grove. And they go way down the road and try to eat some trees down there. And what they found was, what's that called? Pheromones, pheromones thank you. Um, pheromones, the tree that was being ravished, put off a pheromone or an odor that communicate through smell, put off an odor a pheromone that was distasteful and all the trees around it responded the same way because they picked up on it and saved the grove and the giraffes had to go down, go down the road. And, 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 and I probably won't get this perfectly right, but you don't need to tell them that. Okay? <laughs> Ignorance can be bliss if it's not life or death. Okay. She has taught me through, about the trees underground they have their root systems that they can through fungus they can transmit information about being attacked by a pest insects disease something like that and warn the other trees and even share resources underground with one another if one is sick and hurting can tap in the root system of another one and they work together as a collective now People are the only ones that use language to communicate. We're the only ones that can use language. But animals do communicate. They don't do it through language. They just, that they can't communicate with one another. Well, it appears that plants through smell can warn. We know that pollen, we know that pollinates. We know that one tree has to have pollen from another tree. But it appears that, that it, it's almost like this is like intelligent design. It's almost like God made this big, beautiful world so we wouldn't miss his truth, even if we didn't read the Bible. That we would know, hey, you're all interconnected because I like family. There's Father, Son, Holy Ghost, and we're all in relationship with each other. 
We, I, I've created relationship. I, I, create, I am love. And what, what does love do? Love wants to be in a relationship where they can share that love with somebody. And I don't want you to be isolated and alone. And I want you to be part of a family. And I, I want to bring you in. And there's healthy stuff that happens. You can be sick, but sit next to somebody who's healthy and they can help you. That's, that's why I created this thing because pro- sooner or later, you're going to need somebody else. You're going to need somebody else. And so even within nature, we see this thing. And God's so good. He's like, hey, wouldn't you like to have your roots messed up with somebody else's roots? So if you needed something, you could get something. And if they need something, they could get something. Wouldn't that be great? And then if you would come into relationship around a common task, I'll get in the middle of that. And I'll do something that grabs people's attention and says, what was that? And we'll all say, look, I can only produce this much. If it's this much, it must be God. So, you know, in two weeks, we'll start, two weeks from today, we'll start our Join the Journey, a six-week sermon series on Sunday morning about our mission, vision, and our core values. Then during the week, we're having growth groups, and we're asking everybody to get in a growth group for six weeks so that you, the, the task, the task is learning or identifying or assimilating the values of our church. That's the task. But the goal is relationship. The goal is that we make friends with people in the room that we can call during the week when we need somebody to talk to. We can call somebody during the week and be friends with. That's our goal. This next six, eight weeks are really important at New Covenant because God's doing a lot of stuff on Sunday morning. we got a ton of people right now. God is moving in our church, doing great stuff. But we want to make sure that it's not just a place to sit and watch. That it's a place where you can do life and love life. And I'm trying to show you biblically and also through creation that God's really big on groups. He's really big on relationships and stuff, and so are we. Okay? All right. Lord, we honor you and thank you for your grace to us. You're good to us. Thank you that everywhere we look, we can see your hand. You created all of this on purpose. You had a plan, and we want to be part of that plan. And we do not want to be left out. We don't want to be lonely. We don't want to be marginalized. All of us have something to contribute. So I'm asking that during this time, not just that we would learn about our mission, vision, and values, but Lord, I'm asking for, for you to connect some people with one another. I'm asking you to show people who their tribe is. I'm asking you to fill some... Hmm. I'm asking you to address the loneliness that some of our folks feel. I'm asking for you to address those who feel marginalized like they don't have a voice. There are people in this room who confide in me on their Connect card how they feel. And Lord, I want them to have a friend. I want them to have people that love doing life with them. And I'm asking that you would do the relational things that I can't do, the rest of us can't do, but only you can do. And if we put ourselves out there, God, and we make an effort, would you please respond by connecting us with people that we enjoy being around, that life us, that energize us. And Lord, if there's some people in the room that are especially those who lead companies or lead organizations. I'm asking God that you would put some people around them that are the same caliber, that could form a collective, that they would find their tribe and encourage one another and be able to be better than they even are right now because they have other people like them in their world. I'm also just aware that there could be somebody here today that doesn't know Jesus as their Savior. There could be somebody here today that says, I'm really hurting. I'm in a bad spot, and I don't know what to do. And I would say to the other person, Jesus is the answer to every problem you have. And I would say to you, he will take you today just like you are. He would love to be in relationship with you. And if that's you, he wants you to make a move towards him, and he will respond with his love. So, Papa, if that person's in the room, I'm asking you to woo their heart, give them the bravery and courage, let somebody pray with them so that they could come into relationship with you. We love you and we thank you for your grace in Jesus' name.